I chose the title The Rates of Change because I've noticed in my life, as many people probably have in this strange year or so that we've been through, that time is um, warping constantly in our minds. So, you know, there's this idea that if you're doing something really nice, it can seem like an instant, just really quick. And if you're doing something that you loathe and you really don't want to do, it feels like it goes on for a year. So the way that we perceive time is depending on what we're doing and also on the things that we remember. So if you do a lot of new things in your life, um, you commit them to memory really often. And that makes time feel like it's longer because you remember lots of new experiences. But if you um, are doing something that you really loathe, you don't commit anything to memory because you've done it so many times before because it's very repetitive. So then life seems really short. And I think the thing about the last year is that because we've not been having a lot of new experiences, um, time's gone strangely quickly. But then at other, time, other moments, it seemed to go on and on forever. So the rates of change is to do with the way that we perceive time as humans, depending on the context that we're in. But also, when we think about the word change, change is exactly the same as time. They could actually be one word. Because without change, time wouldn't exist. So you only know that time is happening because things happen, things change. My hand moves or a feather falls or the sun and the moon revolve around the earth. So the rates of change is also a measurement of time. And I'm quite into this idea that we can control time and that we can control change. Um, I don't think everything is written and I don't, I'm not a massive believer in fate. I believe that uh, we all have agency um, and we all have time and we all have attention and they're three of our greatest currencies and assets that we have. They're far more valuable than money, for example. Um, and I think with those assets of freedom and agency, we can create change for a positive good. So, any situation, I believe, can be um, modified to be better. So, in a, in a very like holistic sense, the exhibition is about those ideas. But the way that those ideas fall out into the world, in the artworks, is less um, didactic and less obvious. Because it's important that the works are left open enough that everyone that visits the show interprets what they will into them. So they don't explain these things, the works. They don't explain this idea of time and the rates of change. They just question it. Um, I'm of the opinion that good art can start in one point but finishes in a million different points. And those million different points are a million different people that see them. Because although we as humans have a great deal in common, more in common than we do different, you know, it's not like I've got five heads and you've got six heads. Um, we interpret things differently based on our education, our knowledge, our development and our context and that might be the country that we're from, the language or customs that we use in that country. Um, so I think bad art is art that is given to you and it communicates something and then you leave it and everyone leaves it with the same interpretation. That's not art at all really, that falls into other categories like design, communication, cinema, entertainment. Art is a thing that is intangible, that can't be pinned down.
I think I started to work with the theme of time um, when I became 40 years old, which is when people stereotypically have a midlife crisis. Um, I think it's also the, the product of having children. When you have children, all of a sudden you're given a perspective on your legacy and on your um, whether what you leave behind. I mean, all humans want to leave a trace of themselves. That's completely natural. That's why there's park benches with inscriptions in and statues of people and tombstones. And it's why that there is a human tendency to want to recreate ourselves. So I guess, I mean, the cliche is that a midlife crisis is that we get to a point where we think we, don't, we only have as much time left as the time we've lived and we freak out because all of a sudden the end is closer. Um, and I just thought, instead of panicking, I thought, that's such a good subject because everyone will feel that and everybody understands that the, their instinctive impulse for human legacy and every, I mean, it's a universal subject, no matter who you are, where you're from, what your culture is, that we have a fear of dying. And that is something that animals don't have. They don't really, I mean, they, animals avoid death, but they don't procrastinate and think about death all the time like humans do. And I think, you know, modern society uh, in a lot of cultures is it's sort of set up to distract us from the fact that we're mortal and that we're not here forever because obviously the human brain's quite big um, and it can think of a lot of things and some of those things it can't actually cope with. I think humans struggle to cope with the idea that it's like a terrifying tangible moment where you realize you're actually alive like right now we can move you know humans have these moments there's a word for it existential so humans as humans all humans have you know it's a big universal subject it's something we think about no what no matter what culture we're from um, humans have these very like vivid real terrifying tangible existential moments where we just stop and realize that we are actually alive and that time is moving and that is to do with being you know conscious and self-conscious which is something that not all animals necessarily are but um i just thought it was such a great subject because everybody could relate to it but i didn't want to make work about that in a terrifying dark way i wanted to make work about that that made us see it from a different perspective and from from seeing that that subject from a different perspective would sort of teach us that you could see anything from a different perspective so maybe like if there's anything that's profoundly good or moral or ethical or helpful that comes from the work it's that maybe it teaches us to have some humility and perspective and empathy. I think the, uh, as well as this idea that the present can be changed with our agency and the time that we have and what we spend our time doing, which is our attention, there's also this idea that if we can control our perspective and we can gain the ability to see any situation from other perspectives, we'll have a bigger view of it. And with that bigger view, we'll all deal with the world better and deal with each other better. So, yeah, I, I mean, if I was, sometimes my children ask me, if you were a superhero, what, would, what superhero would you be or what would your superpower be? And the common ones that they always say is, would you be able to fly or would you be invisible? And um, I always say fly. But then recently I've started to think maybe the best superpower, if I was a superhero, 
would be the ability to change perspective because it's really hard for humans to do it. But imagine if you could just flick a switch and be in the shoes of the person who is arguing with you, who has completely the opposite political perspective. Instantly, you would have a sort of holistic bird's eye view on everything. Your knowledge and your empathy would be so enhanced that you'd be able to deal with any situation. Yeah, I don't know what the superhero would be called. Empathy man or woman. Empathy woman, not me. Someone else could be called empathy woman. The cats in the work, there's a lot of cats in my work, all types of cats. Um, and I think cats are really funny because they're kind of like an emoji. They're kind of like a universal signifier or symbol. But when you look at a cat and you look at the mythology of cats and the symbolism of cats and how cats appear in throughout history in different cultures, it's so, they're so broad and wide ranging. Like a black cat can be lucky or unlucky, depending on what culture you're in. Um, so the way the cats appear in my work in this exhibition are as, as uh, on a balance of a seesaw between reality and fiction inside the gallery, the institution of art, and outside in the real world. So they, they're in the middle of a seesaw. They're always a balance between never knowing what they are. So they're inside, so they could be domestic cats, but they look like street cats, alley cats. So they look homeless. So they're also on the balance between being institutional and sort of subcultural. Um, so they're political as well in that respect because they're neither in pr private space or public space. But um, the cats are basically squatters because the plinths that the cats are on are all plinths from um, significant, historically significant artworks by significant artists. Um, artists that I like the work of. So the way that they've made is I gained all the plinth dimensions from some other artists' artworks, recreated the plinths, but then had the cat squat them. So a squatter is someone who um, doesn't belong somewhere, but takes ownership of that place anyway. So in a sense, the cats are outsiders in an insider world. And I think for me, the idea that the cats are outsiders in an insider's world is a kind of humorous poke at the idea of, at the idea that art is essentially really, really elitist. It's not like car racing or like um, fashion design or like, restaurants and food. These are things that are appreciated by almost everyone, you know. They're kind of big subjects, football, for example, people have knowledge of and really appreciate. Art should be really for, well, there's a good saying which art should be for everyone, but isn't for everyone. Should be for anyone, but isn't for everyone. Um, but I feel a bit like art, isn't really for everyone and it really it, and I don't like it I think art being creative is a natural human response to being alive and everyone is creative you know the clothes that we put on in the morning is a creative act the food that we prepare at home is a creative act the sticker that we have on the bumper of our car is a creative act the objects that we um, put on our windowsill is a creative act these are all creative decisions that communicate something to someone else. So essentially, it's, that is the work of an artist. Um, and I think that it should be, it shouldn't be elitist. It shouldn't, there's a lot of um, 
baggage and stigma attached to art, especially in British working class culture, that it is for the rich and the well educated and not for everyone. Um, and I quite like this idea that, I mean, for me, my work, I would say, is quite intellectual and you do need to spend a little bit of time with it. It's not for the eyes, it's not retinal art, it's for the brain, it's cognitive art. But saying that, um, I think one of the things that I really enjoy doing is putting things in the work that makes the work accessible. And that could be a different device, it could be humour, or it could be intrigue, or it could be discovery, or it could be scale, or, you know, there's, there's many ways of creating, um, seducing someone who is scared of feeling like an outsider in a museum, seducing them into spectating and participating with the work without them realising they're actually doing it. So, and I mean, essentially, when you look at the study of semiotics and language, we have natural signs and we have conventional signs. And um, conventional signs are all the things that you'd find in an art gallery that look like art. And natural signs are all the things that you'd find in the world. Um, and the big difference between them is intent. So anything that has been made by a human to communicate something to you, Ha, that with an intention is a conventional sign. And then maybe, so like a painting or a traffic light or a book, they're all conventional signs. But then things that you just come across in the world, like a full moon or like um, a shopping list that somebody's dropped outside the supermarket or like uh, footprints in the sand or in the snow, they're all natural signs. They exist in the world mostly, and they don't have intention. They communicate something, but they weren't made to communicate to you. And I think that what's really interesting for me, I'm really into like um, detective series and things like that, crime dramas. And crime dramas and Sherlock Holmes and all those programs and all those books, they are, they're really fed with these natural signs, these accidental clues. So if we're like very aware of ourselves in the world and we look around and we keep our eyes open and our minds open, we'll see like thousands and thousands of clues, natural signs. So it seemed, kind of it's instinctive for me to try to incorporate as many natural looking signs into my work as possible not just things that you know it's a painting you paint it it's a picture of this there you go and you understand it for me that's not um an experience that's uh, a transaction an experience is something that grows that when you start it you don't know where it's going to end Um, the COVID era. Mm. The COVID era did change my work a bit, but it didn't change the intention of the work or even the subjects of the work. It changed the way that I appreciated my job. So, effectively, being an artist is the best job in the world. Um, there is not a better job, and I never thought that I would be an artist, really. I mean, I went to art school, but I imagine that I wouldn't be an artist. I've just been very lucky to be an artist. And, you know, I think it's important that people who have great jobs like that remind themselves how lucky they are all the time. And I think, that's just been heightened with COVID, the COVID era, because I haven't been able to go anywhere. Um, I mean, for me, my source material, like my research, my sketchbook, 
is traveling, it's exploring other cultures and seeing the nuances and the idiosyncrasies of other cultures. You know, from body language to the way food is served, to clothes that people wear, to traditions and customs, to relics, gestures, all these things are what make up my work. Um, and I haven't had it. So usually I take maybe 5,000 photos a year that I print as source material. And this year I've probably taken 500. Um, so it's been a little bit like a drought. So that's one, one thing. Um, I feel like I've had more time to question my work, but I don't necessarily know if that's a good thing or not, because when artists question their work, they procrastinate. It's one of the biggest, um, procrastination is one of the biggest uh, hindrances of being productive. I think for me, the best way to make work is to just make it. I think I want to make that and then I make it. And if it's rubbish, I put it in the bin. And if it's great, then it gets shown. But I haven't really done that. I've wondered how things will look. And in that space, in that, in that duration, that too much time, some things I've talked myself out of that I shouldn't have talked myself out of. I use titles in different ways. A lot of people do often say that the titles are very poetic, um, but they're not all poetic. There's three main ways that I use titles. Uh, there's one way of using a title is to add romance and poetry. If the work is a bit dry and overly conceptual. Um, the other way is there's a saying in British language that is a red herring. And it comes from when uh, people would hunt with a dog and the animal they were hunting, when they wanted the dog to stop chasing the animal, they'd throw a red herring, which is a very smelly fish, into the field and the dog's scent would be cut so they wouldn't be able to uh, follow the animal they were hunting anymore. So one way of using a title is as a red herring. And the way I do that is uh, I think is something that's not related to the work. And then one another way that I use a title is as a descriptive title. So many artists traditionally use the title untitled, which is weird because that is in itself a decision. So it is a title and it has, it communicates a lot as well. Um, so what I usually do instead of using untitled, if I want really as little information as possible, I just give a descriptive title. So like, a photograph of my mother would be called a photograph of my mother. Um, and a lot of the titles uh, I save on it on my phone. So whenever I think of something or I hear something, I just write it on my phone. And the, the list that I have of titles must be thousands and thousands and thousands and I've collected them for about yeah more than a decade so and there's always um, a, a big database to turn to if I'm stuck a long dotted line is the title of that work, which is the new sculpture on the roof, the public sculpture, that refers to the duration of our lives. Our long dotted line, I see as a line on a graph, which is the line of your life. And the dots are kind of events that, um, that happen along that duration. Um, and the sculpture is a, it's a giant, wristwatch wrapped around a stone and the stone is a stone that my children found on the beach near our house um, I was reading a lot when when I started making that work I was reading a lot about the ideas of time and the way that we 
define and name time. So um, there's two main words to describe time in Greek language, and one is chronos and the other one is kairos. And chronos refers to time the way it's measured like on a watch or on a clock. Uh, and it's about an inve a human invention or measurement system dictating what we do when. Kairos is, refers to the idea of time in a sense of readiness. So we do things when it's the right time to do them, the apt time to do them. Um, and I'd never heard of Kairos before. And because of we're in this like accelerated late capitalist era where the whole of the world now is run by time but it's not run by Kairos. In prehistory and history, it has been run by Kairos, but now it's run by Kronos. Um, and examples of when it was run by Kairos would be ancient civilizations where maybe nomadic people, they would move with the seasons because the seasons dictated where food, water supplies would be. Um, a simple way of thinking about Kai the relationship between Kairos and Kronos is uh, we have our dinner at 6 p.m. because that's dinner time. So when the clock goes to 6 p.m. we eat dinner. But if we were running ourselves on Kairos, we would have dinner when we were hungry. In fact, we might have seven dinners, just depending on how we felt. So I like this idea that there's this other way of living that Obviously, it would be unrealistic to live like that now. The world isn't set up for it, but I like this idea that we could measure our lives and we could measure the dots on our long dotted line by Kairos, and the trajectory and the weaves and turns of our lives would be really different to the way that they are in our actual lives. For me, um, I don't wear a wristwatch anymore. And I've got some nice watches that are historic pieces. Um, I've, for a, a while I collected watches, all different types of watches, from very cheap ones to quite expensive ones. Um, and I saw them being a bit like art, the value system that artworks lurk in. Uh, watches also place themselves there as well. There's a sort of financial value to them, but there's also a kind of emotional value. There could be a sentimental value, historic value, brand value. There's all, all the similar kinds of things with art. And for that reason, they're very, very interesting things. But I've stopped wearing one, and the reason why I've stopped wearing one is the same reason that I have deleted Instagram from my phone. Because I feel a little bit like my life benefits from not knowing as much as knowing things. That life is enhanced by being oblivious to things. In a sense, Instagram is based on crowd speak, which is just people saying the same thing as each other, whether they understand it or not. And time is very similar, the knowledge of time. It's just a conformist way of looking at the way we do things. Um, we go to work nine to five, we go to sleep at 11 o'clock, we wake up, you know. If you put a human in, uh, took the, a watch off a human, you put them in the dark, they wouldn't sleep for eight hours. They'd sleep in three hour cycles many times a day. It's only the sun and time that makes us have the routines that we have. So. I just wonder if there's a better way of exploring the world, being oblivious to conformity. It's very hard to escape though. My recent interests is time has led me to a kind of, quite naturally, to an interest in prehistory, weirdly. The Neanderthal. 
what was before the developed human. Because I'm quite obsessed and preoccupied with trajectories of change, rates of change, but also the trajectories. So, you know, any moment could create a para possible other reality. Every decision that we make, there's millions of realities for all of us. Um, and any moment, any decision, any change in now can create a different future. Um, and I'm quite interested in the idea that what would be changes 50,000 years ago and what would the world look like if that tiny change had happened that long ago? So that's what I'm looking at now. Um, and I'm Googling monkeys a lot, but I'm not going to tell you about that. Um, yeah, the only thing that I did want to say is that I wanted to say thanks to everyone at Space K for the show and everything, because it's been amazing, and I'm really sad not to be there. Um, and I just wanted to say to the people of South Korea, you have such an exceptional culture. You should consider yourselves very, very lucky. You have uh, amazing country to live in with amazing culture and history and I wish I was there to share it with you.